I'm Michelle. Uh, I've been in food and tech for the last few years, even though I'm a clinical dietitian and started out as an academic. I like to call myself a recovering academic. Um, <laughs> in the last few years, I started out at Zesty, which is now acquired by Square, and created a new company called uh, Raised Real, which services healthy food for infants and children. And we um, service families throughout, um, throughout all of the US. Uh, today, I'm the founder of Quantitative Nutrition, and we employ data-driven methods to explore nutrition. I'll hand it over to Noah now. Hi. So this, this talk is a kind of an interesting talk because in uh, about the late 90s, I studied nutritional science. There was a period of my life where I was really obsessed with like fitness, and I wanted to be a professional athlete, and nutrition was this passion of mine. And uh, I remember there's two different studies I did in school. One of them was uh, I centrifuged my own blood in a nutritional biochemistry class, and one of the surprising results was that uh, there was a woman that was just exceptional in terms of uh, her diet, her exercise, a uh, straight-A student, and did everything she was supposed to do, and her cholesterol was just off the charts bad, and she was 19. And then um, you know, there's other students who were not exceptional in terms of following all the advice, and they had you know, excellent uh, cholesterol. So that, that got me thinking a little bit. Second, uh, we also did a study that changed the way I behaved in the last 20 years is we um, stopped taking vitamins, and then we uh, took mega doses of vitamin C and captured our own urine, like literally everything that we excreted for several days. And then uh, can you guess what the outcome was? Uh, it was actually exactly the milligrams we took was excreted into our urine. So that definitely got me thinking about, hmm, you know, one, experimenting on my own body, and then two, that uh, maybe some of the things that we think about are, are not true about nutrition. And so in particular, uh, some stuff that's come out in the last few years uh, that's, that's really fascinating is that Harvard of all schools, you know, the, the number one university in the United States, maybe the world, uh, in the 1950s was engaged in um, some interesting funding by the Sugar Research Foundation in terms of sugar. And one of the things that they, they actually, the sugar industry was doing was actually uh, paying the, these nutrition, uh, these professors in the nutrition department to actually uh, say that sugar was actually good for you. And uh, one of the, the doctors here, uh, his name is Dr. Hegstead, uh, mentioned that uh, we're aware of, we are well aware of your particular um, interests and we will make sure we cover this the best we can. And, uh, am I missing anything? Well, just remember this name, Dr. Hegstead, because we'll come back to him later. But he, he later went on to become the head of the USDA Dietary Guidelines. And that's when sugar became a food group for the first time. Um, <laughs> surprise. So <laughs> um, this is also coincidentally when obesity epidemic um, started around the late 70s, early 80s. And then if you look at this uh, next slide here, and there, there's actually been a lot of books recently there are popular books that have come out about this, but um, you know, this is uh, sugar availability essentially uh, over the last, let's say 150 years, and you can see like just exponential, right? There, there, there is the, um, we really haven't been consuming large quantities of sugar except for in an un industrialized setting. Uh, and if you look at some of the other things that are happening uh, right now in particular, there's, you know, op op um, Opiates, for example, are killing hundreds of thousands of people. Social media, destabling democracies. Sugar, these are all optional things. We don't need any of them. And also they're driven by uh, industry and they also uh, have uh, really strong externalities. So we have this move fast and break things, but there's, there's a, you know, a lack of uh, paying attention to externalities. And so again, if we look at this nu nutrition confusion, here we have the industry funding, uh, and, and that's how the, the results actually um, come into play. Even a couple years ago, uh, sugar-based sugar um, drink companies were um, basically promoting research about how exercise really is the cure for diabetes, not you know, limiting your consumption of soda. And also in terms of uh, design study, you know, we have this um, you know, biases and limitations of these designs because they're, they're really they're driven by the, the food industry. And so we then, as a result, get uh, inconclusive or biased results. And then the recommendation to the public often are even censored. And so this is something actually Michelle knows more than I do, but maybe you could elaborate on that. 
Yeah, if we look at uh, the confusion that's happened around sugar, um, over 50% of the uh, studies funded um, have been, sorry, over 50% 50, 50 of the studies have been funded by industry. And all of those studies provide results in favor of industry. So none of them say that sugar is bad for you. And when we trickle down to the dietary guidelines, um, there've actually been censorship of the um, recommendations from the experts on the board. They actually didn't allow people to put in the dietary guidelines that we should be avoiding um, sugar sweetened beverages like soda. Yeah, and, and so what this kind of leads to is, and, and this is, What's interesting is that I do, I teach machine learning and I, I'm very involved in the software industry, but my roots were I, I'd studied nutritional science way back in the 90s, and I remember all this. There was, there was this food pyramid in 1992 that I learned in my nutrition textbooks, and then if you go back even earlier, there was in 1943, the basic seven, and then in 1955, the basic four, and then this is the part that, that you know more about is in, yeah, if you look at the bottom left corner where it says daily food guide, next to it is the sugar section. This is the first time sugar becomes a food group um, in Dr. Hegstead's uh, uh, food guide. And this is the, the third edition of the food recommendations. Um, this is also when he was you know, promoted to becoming the head of the dietary guidelines. So, so we, we basically have some very dubious recommendations that are not science-based that we've been telling people for decades and diabetes is still rising. Obesity, two, two, two out of three people are either obese or overweight in the United States. So there's something going on here. And then now, because I've been involved so much in data science, um, I'm looking at this problem more like how it's all the data science problem. And in this graph, which might be a little bit hard to read, I'll explain is that I took the CDC, uh, a recent um, study that they had that looked at education level and grams of sugar you have per day. And what's really fascinating about this is that you can see that this is actually an education-based issue. So uh, three times higher sugar intake if you have, a, if you have less than high school education versus uh, a college education. So um, basically, the, this, this misinformation often spread by our own government is actually having an influence uh, on uh, actually the health of, of people that are uneducated, unfortunately. And uh, what's, what's interesting about this is that it almost in a way you could think of it as like a bimodal distribution uh, with uh, some of this data that you get from social media, you, you actually may be obsessive and actually get into maybe a food, a food disorder and, and you could almost call that like too much information. And then on the flip side, you have another, you know, a group of population that is actually being, uh, you know, really not conscious of their health, but also being uh, in, in the end result is it's unhealthy. If I'm explaining yeah. it, yeah. And so uh, another interesting aspect to it is that I also took that same CDC data and looked at it from a regional uh, effect. And what's fascinating about this is that it also looks a lot like, let's say, you know, those graphs where they show Duck Dynasty and then they show, you know, uh, like yeah, Modern Family or something like that, that, that there's this whole regional effect with sugar as well. And uh, in, in terms of a story, I'll, I'll tell you, I lived in Atlanta for about five years. And I remember when I was in a sandwich restaurant that I was still getting used to the concept of sweet tea. And I, I looked at this, you know, I don't know, big, a jug of iced tea that they had just brewed. And I said, like, oh wow, iced tea, great. That, that looks like it's something I might enjoy. And then someone comes out the back and they have actually a five gallon bucket of sugar full and then they, they dump it inside there. Like, wow, that, like I, I thought that everyone knew that this is actually a toxin. So we're literally putting buckets of toxin, you know, into people's drinks. So um, kind of interesting, that, but that's a regional, it's a cultural thing that, you know, sweet tea is a, is a beverage that, people enjoy. And one of the other interesting things about the uh, sugar uh, intake uh, is that, you know, the other slides show that this is a new phenomenon. Sugar is completely optional. You don't need it in your diet. It's really a, a product of the Western diet. But if you look at, actually, this is a study that I, that I pulled up just recently that showed uh, the, the, the impact of ultra-processed food. So ultra-processed food is basically the food industry made it. Uh, 
90% of sugar that's added to our diet is from ultra processed food. So if you wanna have a really simple way to reduce the sugar, which is a toxin uh, by most people's account, uh, in your diet, if you don't have things that are manufactured, then you won't have sugar. And you can see here um, how this is this is also coming from the food industry. So we're start we're, we have the same you know result that that started back in in the 50s. And then um, in terms of some of the recent studies, I think that are that actually get around this a little bit and and, and get more of it. Uh, look at the problem more in like a data science or machine learning perspective are these longitudinal studies because they're kind of hard to, to, to fake or hard to, to um, uh, really cook the books with, so to speak. And uh, this is a, um, a study that looked at long, the, the nurses over, uh, you know, let's say several decades and showed uh, how much they either gained weight or they lost weight based on the foods that they had. And what's really fascinating about this is that you could think of this uh, very differently than you would think of the, what you would get the advice from a, a, you know, a traditional uh, dietitian is that if it's a potato chip, if it's a soda, you, the more servings of that you have, the heavier you'll be. But if it's yogurt or if it's nuts, the more servings of that, the lower, the lower weight you'll be. So if you are used to doing machine learning, this would be a feature, right? And so you would put this into a model and you know, you would, you, would, you would maybe use yourself as actually the target. So you would optimize this um, function. And uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll kind of um, wrap up on before I hand it over to Michelle is that to me, this also starts to look like a machine learning problem in that um, most people have uh, had some experience with the local and the global minimum. And, and there's this discussion in the food industry about, uh, you know, Calories, it's all about calories. You know, if you just reduce your calories, it's the first law of thermodynamics, energy in is equal to energy out. But the problem with that is that it, that, it, that may be technically true, but we're, we're, you may be actually talking about a local minimum. What, what, what people don't talk about is, is that, okay, so some, someone lost, let's say 100 pounds, 10 years from now, what do they look like? They're probably the same weight they were before because they're optimizing for this local minimum. So the, these, you know, this very like simplistic view of, you know, uh, reducing your calories or, you know, th thinking of it from this, uh, you know, local minimum perspective is probably not going to be what the future is of um, data science and nutrition. All right. Thanks, Noah. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So this this is just a picture of like the the um, the this. Can you see my mouse? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so this is this is, would be the local minimum, and this would be the global minimum. So if you're walking, you're at the top of a hill, for example, and you have two people. You have a nutritionist, and then you have a machine learning person, and they both want to get their to the way down. Someone could, let's say, very closely follow a certain path, and because they're so closely following this path, and they're there, there may be like they're not they're not looking up. There's actually a shorter path right around the corner, and so that's one of the problems with machine learning and 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 uh, looking at local versus is global is that is that it may look like the right path because you're again paying you know paying so close attention as you walk down the hill, but uh, sometimes you can miss the global minimum. Because if you were, instead of looking down at the path, you were looking up a little bit higher, you could see there's actually, the real bottom is down there, if that makes sense. Thanks for your question. Um, so why don't general recommendations actually work? Um, scientists are concerned with finding the root cause of a disease, whereas people just want to get healthy. And actually, um, it's the perfect fit for something like data science because in this case, we want to optimize for a function like weight loss, or in this case, so the prediction of diabetes. If we look at the Pima Indians of Arizona, they actually have the highest prevalence of diabetes compared to any other known population. And there was a project at um, UC Irvine that actually was able to pre predict with 80% accuracy whether or not this population, um, whether or not someone from this population would develop diabetes just by looking at different factors like glucose and BMI and age and so on. Um, the reason why this is important is because everyone contains different characteristics that make them unique, but also can make them healthy or predispose them to a certain disease. And with personalized nutrition, we can give them better care um, and have more effective treatments. 
tune out if you need to. Okay. So even though general recommendations don't work, this is primarily the method that the food establishment has been using since the beginning of nutrition. And the food establishment is the USDA, which issues the dietary guidelines, CDC, the USDA Foods, which provides school lunch, um, top universities like Harvard, which publish in top journals like Nature and Science. But the problem with this is that it creates a lot of general confusion. Um, people still don't know what to eat, and it also fuels um, opportunities for food marketing. So that's why we've seen the low fat craze. Um, if anyone remembers the low fat um, or fat free potato chips that had Elestra in it, and coincidentally also caused a lot of diarrhea for people, um, and snack wells, which is a low fat cookie. Um, I think most people these days know that, that is, these foods are not healthy. And the public's response has been to turn towards a more alternative form of nutrition or pop science. Um, you can see that in misleading websites like Infowars, which is led by Alex Jones, or Goop, um, which is headed by Gwyneth Paltrow. The funny thing is they both actually sell the same supplements, but just marketed to um, different, different populations. Now, what's really worrisome about that is that um, re research in nutrition has been undermined. There's been a loss of trust in the whole system. And in order to reestablish nutrition as a science, we're gonna have to look for some better solutions. There are three ways um, that machine learning can really help rebuild nutrition as a science. Um, the first is replacing this reductionist theory um, with something that's more holistic. The reductionist theory looks at biological mechanisms and then kind of generalizes these findings to a bigger population. So for example, um, with the study of scurvy, uh, we know that you know, adding vitamin C can uh, treat scurvy. So re the reductionist way of thinking was a really great way to kind of study diseases of deficiency, but we don't live in an era of deficiency anymore. We live in an era of overabundance. So in order to study overabundance, we need a more holistic, um, kind of multifactorial systems approach, um, which is best suited for machine learning. I'll go into um, how we can replace nutrition studies in a bit. But generally, there are two types of nutrition studies. There's observational studies, and then there's clinical trials. And observational studies are exactly what they sound like. They are observing um, participants either in the present or in the past. And that requires asking people like, what did you eat today or last year? Did you eat more broccoli this year or the year before? Um, and the problem with that is people either lie or they can't remember or both. Um, so that makes for a really crappy study design. The second is a clinical trial, which is extremely expensive, has a host of other problems that I'll go into in the next slide. The last is replacing these general recommendations with a more personalized um, approach. So using machine learning methods, we can kind of get rid of the food pyramid and get rid of this my plate and um, these very you know, confusing um, diagrams and pamphlets that we give to people and start giving people real advice that can actually help them towards a certain goal. So um, this is a typical diagram you would see from a clinical trial. Um, it's 2D. There's two, um, two variables on the X and Y axis. You know, usually it's some sort of treatment or dose and then the outcome. Um, and there's no room to really look at context or like the patient characteristics. Um, usually there's two groups, a treatment group and a control group. And because of that, it makes it inherently not a good method for studying personalization. It's more of a method to kind of compare two different treatments. Um, the three main problems with a clinical trial are that um, it's poor adherence. So most participants will fail to stick to a certain intervention for a long period of time. A good example is a women's health study, which costs I think hundreds of millions of dollars, and they tried to test um, whether or not a low-fat diet would be healthy. And at the end of the trial, the scientists discovered that there was no difference between the groups because everybody didn't stick to the diet that was recommended to them. They kind of just did their own thing. Um, it's extremely limited in scope, so you have to look at subgroups, um, like tiny subgroups with limited treatments. So for instance, um, 
18 to 24 year olds living in the Bay Area who are non-obese with, uh, with diabetes and who work in the tech industry. Because it's so small, it makes it really hard to generalize to a larger population. Um, it's also very expensive, takes a lot of time and personnel. And at the end of all of this, um, all the data is lost. It's not stored somewhere, it's just tossed out. And because there's no paper trail, um, it makes it extremely difficult for um, people to check how the data is computed. Uh, it makes room for a lot of scientific fraud. Alternatively, with machine learning, um, you can see the biggest difference is that we produce high dimensional uh, diagrams. They are 3D. So in this particular case, we're looking at a dosage of a particular tr treatment and then the outcome, which is survival. But we're also looking at the context of the patient, which is weight here. So for a low weight patient, um, a low dosage would create a, a high rate of sur survival, whereas a high dosage for a low weight patient would produce a low survival outcome. The context is really important, which makes it better for um, personalization. Whereas this is just one feature, we can look at unlimited data points. We can add even more features to make it um, a highly accurate model. The biggest benefit of machine learning is that it's focused on prediction. Especially when it comes to public health, we want to focus on prevention and prediction. Because when someone gets to the point of no return, and if they're highly obese or they're diabetic or they have chronic diseases, it's extremely hard to revert back to a healthy state. And this is especially true for kids because kids grow adipocytes or fat cells when they're younger and they hold on to that same number of fat cells into adulthood. So it makes it really hard for them to um, either lose weight or stay at a healthy weight. The last is just better computation. So with these super expensive uh, clinical trials that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, at the end, scientists are using p-values to compare two different groups. Um, I'm sure you've heard of p-value hacking, which is the reason why the hundreds of papers have been retracted from the nutrition field alone. With machine learning, we're not so interested in comparing one group to another, right? So we want to look at prediction and how best to um, measure the probability of choosing a certain treatment. Do I have anything else? Yeah, and one, one other thing that's kind of interesting about the, um, this highly dimensional data as well is that the, you know, the common definition for highly dimensional data is that there are more attributes than rows that there's just a very different um, way of thinking, as Michelle put it, that you, you can keep plugging things in. If you have enough data, essentially the error gets to zero. So we're, we're potentially looking at things that have extremely high error rates or you know, really low probability of, of increasing uh, the outcome that we want. But when you're looking at things from a machine learning perspective, um, you're, you're really looking at things that, in, in theory, actually have the you know probability of one you know when you get enough data and you collect those points and 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 this this really gets into the, the almost like a legacy issue with the medical industry that's even outside of nutrition is that you know there there isn't this 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 type of thinking around I mean there are I'm sure some people that are thinking about this but isn't prevalent that you know there's really a big data problem. So what does this look like um, as an application in healthcare? Um, so incoming data would come in from electronic health records or uh, wearables, um, apps, um, other sources to a central server, which is then computing things in a 3D holistic way. Um, and physicians or individuals can use this to kind of guide them to making the right decisions. And then the data is stored and continuing to, uh, continuing to learn and produce um, better probabilities for treatment selection. I really want to emphasize this is still human-led and human-centered because you still need domain expertise to create good models. That old adage of you are what you eat also applies to machine learning because if we feed the program you know, crappy studies that were biased and had inconclusive results, you're going to produce a crappy model. Um, so it's important that the two go hand in hand. And that leads me to model explainability. Um, this is an issue that has been rampant in the nutrition world for since the beginning of nutrition studies. Um, because we're measuring one effect, um, one variable uh, as an effect on another variable, 
confounding is definitely an issue that needs to be controlled, but it's impossible to control for every single confounder. Um, that's one of the reasons why you know, a lot of the studies are not so great, and they come up with inconclusive results. Uh, data science can add transparency and visibility to a field that's severely lacking. Um, luckily, with machine learning methods, there are a number of ways to um, explain the model, and Noah's going to add to that. Yeah, so in, in anyone that's, that's using, let's say, some of the most popular open source libraries, like Scikit-Learn, for example, you know that it's a huge trend right now. There's yellow brick for data visualization uh, of, I don't know, making clusters, there's you know, AutoML, there's um, uh, all of these like model explainability uh, technologies. And, and th this, I think, is a perfect timing for solving this problem in nutritional science where you know, if, you, if you go and start looking at this data, um, you can actually go and, and actually find what, what are the features that we care about. Let, let's forget all the pundits. I mean, that, that what's really interesting in particular about the, the website 538, and, and uh, Nate Silver and some of the, why he's become popular and you know, some predictions he made are good, some predictions he made are bad, but one of the things that he pointed out which is, which is really applicable to the nutrition field is that like, the pundits are not who you should be listening to. We, we have decades of evidence that should say they're, they're just very incorrect. But instead, if you just you look at it, the data yourself and every single person here has the ability to actually take control of their own life and look at the data themselves, look at the features that are actually having an effect on their, their own health and their longevity. Uh, so it's, it's actually a really exciting uh, unsolved problem that, that many people can, can solve and potentially even in a, in a very open source way. So hopefully now you're all jazzed about fixing nutrition with data science. I know you're just pining to figure out how you can get involved. So um, I'm gonna go over some opportunities in different sectors. Um, there's definitely an opportunity in the consumer space that's already being done now, um, definitely with digital recommendations with companies like Neutrino, um, which is looking at diabetic recommendations and they've paired up with uh, Medtronic um, to do so. Day two and Suggestic, which is in the Bay Area. Um, there's food and health and pharma um, opportunities as well. Naritas is in Ireland, I believe, and they uh, are using machine learning to discover new biopeptides. Um, Habit is in the Bay Area, and they provide tailored food programs. And Nestle is the first, actually, CPG to pilot a, um, a wellness ambassador program. Currently in Japan, they have 100,000 uh, participants who are sending in their lab data on a daily basis, and Nestle sends them tailored supplements and, and foods. The last I find really, um, really exciting, it's the commercialization of research. I would love to see um, the democratization of research because it's so costly and so um, time intensive as it is right now. There's companies like Medrio, Proofpilot, and Medidata, which are allowing people to use cloud systems um, and digital uh, methods to kind of expedite research. In academia, there are a number of ways that machine learning can be applied. Um, definitely looking at research methods using AI, machine learning, and data science. Um, within clinical study trials themselves, there's a number of different models that we can use, um, like in silico clinical trials, which are simulated patient populations. Um, so instead of having to recruit you know, 100,000 participants, they can simulate with 100,000 um, digital patients. The N of one design um, allows each participant to be their own control. So instead of randomizing different groups artificially, um, you're randomizing the time of treatment. And this is one that's gaining traction right now. Uh, and there's digital observational studies. So there's so much being developed on the computer vision AI side that allows for a better um, observation of food intake opposed to you know, using, you know, using food frequency questionnaires or um, like interviews or something. Within policy, obviously a lot needs to change. I hope that data science can bring more transparency to the industry and to policy. Um, with that, perhaps we can retire the food pyramid and my plate um, and provide more opportunities for decentralized and maybe um, more democratized nutrition programs. 
but the goal should be focused on prevention and prediction. Um, instead of this strange recommendation approach that we've been taking, maybe we can kind of focus our goals on um, strategies that actually work for people. I'm going to end with this last slide. You saw um, you know, Noah walk through the different renditions of the food pyramid and ending with my plate. I don't know if you can see, but our, our current model is my plate, which has fruits, vegetables, grains, and a cup of dairy. And that's as general as it comes. I don't even know what that means. Like a dairy, cup of what dairy? <laughs> um, with this era of machine learning, we believe that the next evolution of nutrition will be personal. And with personalized nutrition, you'll have more efficient interventions. You'll be able to decrease costs and provide better care. Yeah, and one, one of the things also that uh, I see as a trend that uh, I guess I'll make a prediction is that maybe in the next two to five years that a lot of the data science and machine learning that's happening manually is going to turn into a more higher level tools. So we already see this with AutoML, so uh, H2O, Google AutoML, uh, Azure AutoML, uh, AWS uh, has uh, AutoML features. And, and what that means is that domain experts can come in and they can actually start using these tools and actually quickly address a problem that they know about. One of the problems with only an isolated, siloed out data science team is that they may not have the full context of the problem. And so if, if at the same time that people are starting to address this nutritional science problem, that at the, that the AutoML tools and data science itself matures to the point where it's not a job and it's actually a capability, then I think that also uh, further uh, increases the likelihood that these problems will get solved very quickly. Cool. And uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the, the we, can, we can kind of le leave it open for, we want to leave some time for questioning um, because there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. So here's our final slide. If you want to get a hold of us, um, there's Michelle's website, my website. I also wrote a book. Um, feel free to buy it. <laughs> questions? Any questions? Yeah, so anyone have any questions? to learn more about this. And like the one question I always have is like, how do I get data, you know? Because you'd love to have all this data of, you know, all the different factors in a person, a individual's life so that you can try to, you know, do data science with it. But yeah, I'm not good, sure good, where you get that. Good question. Yeah. We'll, we'll let both of us address it because we'll both have stuff that will, will be important. So, um, in terms of myself, what I've done that you might be interested in is I've actually weighed myself almost every day, not entirely, but close for the last, let's say, five years. And that's pretty good data because that does tell you what you can, you can observe just without doing machine learning what's happening and, and what effect it has. And I know for a fact now I can look at, look at some stuff and go, oh, yeah, these are some behaviors or things I'm doing that I need to change. So that's one is you could just use your body for data. I also can go to um, the government websites and, and look at and grab data. Like I grab that data from the CDC. Uh, I bet Michelle probably has a bunch of really cool sources I don't even know about. Yeah, um, definitely government agencies are great. You can look at uh, USDA and CDC, um, uh, NIH databases, depending on what you're looking at. There might be a lot out there. I think to find reliable nutrition and food data is really hard. I am one for kind of recreating it and trying to you know, get data yourself if you can. One of the models that I suggested earlier is um, N of one design. So you actually don't need you know, 200,000 participants in a study. You just need really good data from a select few and use them as their own controls. Um, if you're trying to do an intervention study, you kind of do a crossover design and um, kind of play around with uh, the randomization of, of time treatments, but um, it's not necessary to get like a huge, huge data set. Uh, I wanted to see what's the state of the art like for the uh, variable medical devices for measuring like glucose and stuff like that or 
I'm sorry, what was the last part? Uh, like, uh, for, uh, in general, uh, the Internet of Things and wearable medical devices in nutrition. What's the state of the art? Or, or is something happening? Do you, do you know a little bit about this? Uh, are you looking to measure glucose? In, different uh, in general, uh, wearable medical devices, if... Uh, yeah, um, so there are a number of ways to measure glucose these days. Um, you can look for continuous blood glucose monitors. Um, you can, depending on what kind of glu glucose, fasting glucose, you know, continuous glu glucose, there are a number of monitors out there available these days. Um, there are even, you know, uh, under the skin ones that you can wear continuously, um, depending on what you're looking at. There are a number available. Yeah, and also one, one of the people we both know that it works at Neutrino, is it mm -hmm. Neutrino? He was telling me a story, I think, I think this is not confidential, but he was, he was saying he was doing some experimentation on him, himself, I think, mm -hmm. where he was eating different foods and he sees the spike, right, in, you know, in glucose level. And so it, it really could be the case, I'm, there needs to be more data collected, so that could be one for you, is like you just see for yourself what's spiking my, my blood sugar. And if the theory that, having spikes in your blood sugar is bad, then you avoid those foods. Um, on the topic of blood sugar spikes, there's a recent paper that's published by Zivi in Israel, and it was one of the first studies looking at um, how well a machine learning program could actually help people control their blood sugar, and it actually did better than the dietitian program. <laughs> so it did better than a human um, interaction, face-to-face -face kind of model. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for, for machine learning program to help guide people in the right direction. Great talk. In the beginning, you mentioned that uh, the biggest uh, demographic that's impacted by the current nutritional guidelines is, you know, the less than high school education demographic. And I imagine they are a uh, much bigger number than the college level. Uh, the, the, the approach you've uh, highlighted here um, seems um, probably accessible to the latter, the college level. Uh, demographic. What barriers do you see in this particular technology finally making it to a point where it'll actually impact positively the demographic that's really suffering? Not, not to mention that the college demographic is very healthy, but um, you know, I, I, I believe that this has to be really embraced by the health industry, the pharma, pharma industry, the government to really uh, start impacting that particular section of society. Do, do you have any thoughts on what what you envision as the path forward? Yeah, I think when we talk about quantified self, we think a lot about you know like Silicon Valley elite like triathlons who wear Fitbits and Jawbones and stuff, but. Where I see machine learning being integrated later on is actually within the health system. The people who need it the most to help um, you know, with the decision-making process are physicians. My husband's an ER physician. He says he gets to spend, on average, maybe three to five minutes per patient. And you're supposed to assess everything about this patient within three minutes, which is nearly impossible. But if you have a good program where it has stored data um, on the patients gathered from electronic health data or wearables, if you can, later on, the decision-making process would be so much easier. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, an individual monitoring his own health. It might be managed by a physician or clinician or dietitian, nurse. I'm not sure exactly how, but integrated within the health system somehow. We're running out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Noha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.